turn the mic on, please. Hi. Uh, we're going to start in a few minutes. It's just uh, technical settings here with the remote participation. Yes? Okay. So, uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming and joining us in this uh, panel. Uh, I'm, really, I'm really happy in being here and share uh, all the uh, knowledges and also our vision on machine learning and artificial intelligence, especially related to the open data and also related to the uh, digital design. So uh, uh, I will give you a very short uh, and very brief introduction, and then we will move to the floor for our distinguished guests, guests here. So I hope you can also join us afterwards with uh, your question. Uh, <clears throat> Machine learning is leading a, a, a real data revolution. Everybody is talking about uh, artificial intelligence. Governments are talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, big companies, big IT companies are talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, my mom is talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, Perhaps in the future, my pets will also talk about artificial intelligence. So it's a hype topic uh, in this day. And of course, data is, full, uh, is a fool for machine learning in the algorithms. And they are becoming, and the algorithms are becoming more powerful these days. However, uh, it's important to highlight that data is not we equally available and distributed for everybody. Uh, data may be a barrier of entry to ensure the Global South can participate in this new economy. What you are saying is that uh, there, may, there might be a concentration in data ownership. We argue that uh, data is being extracted from the global source and access is being monopolized by big players from the north, what, which is strengthening, entrenching glo uh, technology, global source interposition of consumer, not producer of technology. In this workshop, we discuss how open data principles and web technologies could help to overcome some of the consequences of this data concentration and increase its quality. We also discuss how important it is to bring a humanistic approach in artificial intelligence. So we hope in this workshop to talk about open data, web technologies, and web design for artificial intelligence. So let's move to the floor. I'd like to invite Diogo Cortis to uh, uh, have the floor. And uh, Diogo Cortis is uh, a computer scientist, is also an uh, expert in the web designer. He is a researcher on the Web Technology Study Center at NICBR in Brazil, and also he teaches at the Catholic University in Sao Paulo. You have the floor, Diogo. Okay, thank you. Uh, oh, can you please and the presentation here? All right. So I'm Diogo Cortes. I work at NICBR in the Web Technology Study Center. And I'm also a student professor at Pontifical Catholic University of Sao Paulo. And what I'm going to try to do is to reply those two policy questions that we describe in the workshop, focus more in the design, OK? So first of all, uh, um, we see that the artificial intelligence is touching 
every aspect of our life. Uh, and we start to see a lot of discussion regarding fairness, regarding transparency, regarding explainability, okay? Uh, and for many decades, artificial intelligence was a subject inside like computer science departments uh, or mathematicians, and now we need more than this. We do not just need to build a model and put it in the world. We need to ensure if this model is okay and if it's accept acceptable by the society. So the first action that we need in a, a AI project is a diverse and interdisciplinary team. We do not need just computer science, engineers and mathematicians, but we also need designers, that's an important uh, concern that we bring to this workshop. We also need these people from social science, anthropology, and many areas to make sure that our model works well. And to start, I want to claim that design is much more than interface. Design is important in during the whole process of artificial intelligence project. And we need to start to break artificial intelligence down in some parts. There is no such thing as artificial intelligence. What we have now, today, uh, are different models specialized to do specific things. So we can have a speech recognition model that can recognize someone saying Apple, okay? You can have a different model for image classification that can recognize Apple photos. We can also have a natural language process for autocomplete to write the word Apple. But they, those are different models, completely different, using different techniques. Okay, so there is no such thing as artificial intelligence. We have narrow models to solve a specific problems. Uh, and basically all those models are trained on, based on the data. Okay, so we need to pay attention also on the data. And when you are talking about the user, uh, we have here two main uh, sections, that we, two main divisions. One is the interface, so you have the user. The user will interact with the interface to input and to get output. And this interface actually will use a model, a machine learning model that could be a speech recognition and so on. And the model is based on data, but we will also need metrics. So in this workshop, I'll briefly try to explain or to discuss how design can be applied, or at least it needs to be applied on those two moments, in the interface and also in the model. Uh, so just to start, we, this is our article published in the science, uh, the scientific magazine. Uh, it's a, a study showing that uh, our, our, our AI system uh, in United States, that was used in the United States hospital, uh, were, uh, it, it was discriminating black people when needs to receive a um, special treatment, okay? And it was occurring because the design of this AI system was completely based on spending, financial spending. And if you get the historical data, um, black people has problem to access this. The, the, the health system. So it was a, a strategy, a design strategy that was not good. The, a, a better strategy, a better design strategy, maybe, in this article they 
argue about this was we don't need financial data in this project. We just need to know how is the, the health of each patient. It, it does not matter if it's white or black. Uh, so it's one problem that's occurring. So the first thing that we need to take action is regarding data design. We need to pay attention. Okay, oh sure. Uh, you need to, we need to pay attention that the data is that what fools the AI, you know, machine learning techniques. So I will show briefly here an example that I give to my students. Uh, it's a, a data set, it's a, a, a famous data set that's used in machine learning community to test and verify all the models. It's a data set for Titanic. So you have here a list of data from travelers and who survived and who died at the accident. It's, it's, uh, it's not a, a, a true uh, data set, but it's very interesting because it's very useful to train into, um, to set the, the machine learning algorithms and to, and to do a benchmark. So you have here many what we call in machine learning features, that's the variable. So you have the name, you have the sex, you have the age, you have the fare, you have the class, you have a lot of information. And to do that, for example, uh, just to understand the importance of the design, I got a simple model, that's the decision tree, one of, one of the most simple uh, methods in machine learning, and I train using three uh, variables, uh, class, uh, age, and the fare, okay? Sorry, it's in Portuguese. <laughs> uh, and the system, the behavior of the system is one. And when I decided to add a different variable, for example, sex, the system has a completely different behavior. So you see here that the sex is the most important feature in this model. So I bring this example just to show that the problem is not just on the data. The problem is just in the decisions that we make to use this data. Because in this example, the data was the same, the data, the data set was the same, and the model was the same, decision tree. But my decision to use one variable instead of the other the system's behavior is different. Okay, that's this, the same thing that happened in the article published by Science. And we also need to address a question that we need additional data. Could you Be conclude, please? Yeah, uh, we need additional data. This is a, an example of uh, machine learning image recognition. And for example, uh, those three first here uh, images, the system can recognize as a, a, a ceremony, a wedding, a marriage, okay? But the last one not. And that happens because the system does not have enough data about local cultures, okay? So we need to, some, in some way, try to get it uh, happen. So there are some uh, initiatives like crowdsourcing initiatives. Uh, Google has the crowdsource app that you can take photos, upload photos. Uh, it's a design strategy to get it done. Okay, and just to conclude, we <laughs> we also <laughs> need to give users, and this is an important design technique that I think that uh, Eloisa will tell more, is also give, in the interface, give user more control of the data and of the algorithm. Here's an example, a simple example. Uh, in, in, in Brazil, uh, in Portuguese, if you translate doctor, it translates to medical, that's the male doctor. And if you use nurse, Google translates to enfermeira, that's the female nurse, okay? So it's based on the data, on the example, but we can fix this on the interface also. So that's the fix that Google uh, has done. Now, if you trans uh, translate nurse, they will give you two options, and the user can get what he wants, okay? Please uh, stand. Okay, so 
that I, I have to do. Okay, thank you and sorry. Eloisa. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Diogo, I'm sorry of, of being the clock man, but it's part of my nature, so I have to do that. So let's move to Eloisa Candelo. Um, Eloisa is a researcher on uh, IBM Research Lab in Brazil. So please uh, bring it and share with us your vision on design for uh, artificial intelligence. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I think the presentation is not here. But let's see. The presentation is not changing, sorry. Um, anyway. So I'm Eloisa Candelo, I'm from IBM Research Brazil. Um, I'm going, uh, my first degree was in design and my PhD was in computer science uh, here in, in Europe, in England, University of Brighton. And I'm going to talk a little bit about our projects. So actually, like Diogo said, we have uh, a multidisciplinary group. So we have people from computer science, we have a machine learning experts, we have multi-agent experts, we have people that work with NLP as well. And uh, I'm in the last part here, the last area that is machine teaching. So we are worried now about the interfaces, not actually only the interfaces that the users will use, but actually the interfaces for people that train the machines, the interfaces that uh, People that uh, are not computer science, scientists, are not programmers, and uh, how they can train the machines. So this is the kind of studies that we are doing as well. Here we have uh, several projects that we are working with conversational systems uh, in the last three, four years. So we have the first one there that uh, you have the faces is for microcredits uh, people that they have their micro cred, my micro business, and uh, we we did a project with them. We did field studies as well to understand from the northeast of Brazil. We have a financial advisor that's that green one that's a chat, and people they can talk uh, to different chatbots, and each chatbot represents one investment. It's for financial education. And the other two that are for public spaces, I'm going to explain a little bit more. So, uh, this one, uh, it's a multi-bot platform behind. So it's the same platform as the financial advisor that I told you before. And in this platform, we have three chatbots. So we have three chatbots that they are characters from a book. Uh, it's a famous book in Brazil from Machado de Assis. Actually, the book, the plot is about a love triangle. <laughs> so we have the husband, the wife, and the best friend, and the husband is very jealous. But the, the author of the book does not answer if uh, the wife had uh, an affair or not. And actually, everybody in Brazil has at least one question to ask to those characters. Uh, it was during two months in an exhibition space, and we studied this to understand how people they act and interact with chatbots in public space, and which kind of features uh, we should consider in the design of systems and machines in public space. So I'm going to show a video. So this is a guide from the museum, and he is explaining how to use it. It's St. Jacques because of the surname of the characters. So they add their name. Já digitei meu nome aqui. E veja só como funciona a obra. Nós temos aqui as três opções: o Escobar, a Capitu e o Bentinho. Então eu preciso fazer uma pergunta e direcionar para um dos personagens. A pergunta mais intrigante do livro. The heads represent the characters on the table. Vamos lá ver? So, did you betray her? You betray him? 
and then uh, you have a projector as well and uh, sentiment analysis for each phrase so the cups are colored according to the sentiment of the chatbot so she is very mad and of course she said she didn't do anything and it's like uh, the husband uh, does not have any reason to be worried about but anyway so we studied that to understand how visitors engage with chatbots in public spaces and what are the effects of the audience. So one thing that we noticed is that if people they are observed by other people, they act differently when they are interacting with those machines. So what we saw was people that were observed by acquaintances, like, uh, for example, family and friends and were together, they had a different kind of interaction than the people that they were being observed by strangers or in a queue waiting to interact with the exhibition or around the table, sorry, around the table in front of them. So what we saw was that people that were observed by strangers, they felt more connected with the, the chatbots and they asked more questions as well. Uh, and we had something about gender. So one challenge of chatbots and machines is that people, they think that they are like oracles. You can ask about football, we can ask about the weather, and uh, you can ask about anything. And people, they don't keep the scope of the system. So they don't ask about what actually the system knows. So what we saw that males and females, they behave differently. So we saw that males usually they ask 50% more questions out of scope than women in that context. And we saw that when they were observed by strangers, they ask less out of scope questions. What uh, I mean about out of scope here is like questions that are, that are not related to the book. And we saw as well, thinking about the public space, that users observed by family and friends, they continue engaging and they ask more questions, and users that were addressed by their name, that they could see their name on the table, they also engage it more. But if you have the two variables, like people with family and friends, and the people they, that see at least one name on the table, they don't engage so often, because the machine has to know that you have more people interacting in that space, and not just one person, so they don't engage it more. Two minutes. Okay, so the last one that I'm going to show is like, uh, uh, actually is a kind of challenge because uh, uh, we are going to talk about AI to children in 30 minutes in a museum space. And uh, how can you teach uh, children about AI? So this is a project for, for children nine to 14 years old, will be in a museum uh, next year. And the idea is to, to talk about AI, uh, and what is the minimal understanding that uh, children can have about that? And uh, how can we quash the black box nature of many AI systems? So we did an exhibition as well, uh, and the idea is that you have like Jeopardy, but instead of having two humans and one machine, you have three machines. So those heads represent the machines, actually. And we have three stations where children, they will be in groups uh, teaching those machines. Uh, we have a prototype now in the lab. And the idea is what? OK, you can give all the information to the machines. You can give a spreadsheet. And you can give a database. But the big challenge of machines today is to understand humans. So children, they will teach how humans talk. They will teach uh, examples of uh, human questions to the machines. So here you have an answer, like uh, who is Charles Darwin? And uh, they are going to add questions to the system to train the model. So the idea is like you have, uh, for example, 38% of confidence. Children, they will see that, and later you teach the bot, and you are going to have 95% of confidence, for example. And we are doing tests uh, with children. Yes, so the idea is AI systems use knowledge acquired from human beings. AI systems do not, do not know everything and make mistakes, and AI systems are corrected and improved by human beings. 
Uh, we used uh, delayed, uh, several design <laughs> methods during, I'm not going to explain all that, don't worry. <laughs> we, have, we use uh, several design methods in the process of those projects. We have other projects as well. I can talk more about that later. And that's it. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Eloisa. Thanks very much. So now you're going to have a remote participation, Jamie Boyd. Jamie Boyd is the director of Open Government at Treasury Board of Canada. And we thanks her to join us because I know she's uh, 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 back in the time. So probably it's early in the morning in Canada. So thanks very much to join us. So you have the floor, please, please Jamie. Jamie. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jamie Boyd. Um, the, the description of my position is actually slightly out of date. I am now the Chief Digital Officer of the Government of British Columbia, which is the uh, westernmost province of, of Canada. Um, about 5 million inhabitants. It's a, it's a beautiful spot. I hope that you all come visit at some point. Um, I'd like to, to share a few perspectives today on the topic of AI and open data. And I think that one of the things that, that I bring that is a little bit unusual in the public sector is experience in managing an open data portal. Uh, for the last three years, my team was responsible for the, the management of open.canada.ca, which is the government of Canada's open data portal. And we took a number of AI projects to production. Um, the government of Canada invested quite heavily in, uh, in the idea of, invest, uh, of building out ethical approaches to AI. Um, and so we felt that uh, in the interest of embracing ourselves as a learning organization, it made eminent sense to be, to be shipping products. So I'd like to share with you uh, a few experiences with regards to, um, to, to building out both open data and AI practices and some of the lessons that we learned along the way around the, the great sense that it makes to be leveraging open data um, for AI and vice versa. Uh, I hope that you're able to see the, the deck that I've prepared, um, but if not, well, I'll try to be particularly descriptive in my words. Um, so the, the first thing that I, I do want to do, just recognizing that there, there is a bit of a diverse audience, is a little bit of level setting around, around the, the perspective that many of us bring in governments. Um, and that is very much one of disruption. Uh, the world has changed, compute has never been faster or cheaper, um, and with that, governments are changing. The, the imperative of being uh, porous to innovation is, is, has never been so great. Um, <clears throat> so governments like my own at the subnational level, at the national level, are fairly aggressively leaning into this idea of digital government, which is, of course, uh, a government that uses modern technology as well as the culture and practices of the modern age to deliver great services that are deserving of citizens' trust. It's somewhat important, I think, in the context of talking about adoption of AI to recognize that we are grappling with a fairly significant uh, misalignment in citizen expectations. Um, we, are, we are well aware of this, and we see it uh, manifest in the data around credibility and whatnot. Uh, people around the world have never been so polarized. Their level of trust in public sector institutions has rarely been so low. And this makes sense in the digital age, right? I'm not saying it's a good thing by any means, don't get me wrong, but we have citizens who are able to click and from the palm of their hands, skip the dishes, hail an Uber, and we have bricks and mortar, waterfall-based processes built around citizen delivery, often in the public sector. These misalignments don't make a huge amount of sense. Um, and if you're following on the deck, I'm now on slide five. What we do then is we look at this misalignment and how it represents itself in the views of our citizens. And so I'm, I'm showing you some polling data from, from Canada where you see that 60% of Canadians feel that laws and government policies are not keeping pace with changes in technology. So in that context, there are a few things that, that we do need to somewhat urgently do, in my view, in an effort to more effectively leverage the opportunities of both AI and open data. And I, I wanna speak a little bit about that. So if you go on to, to slide seven, AI in the public sector can very much help us 
in, in, in delivering sound services to our citizens. And that, that's, that's the true north of, of why we exist in the public sector, right? So the sorts of things that effective use of AI can do is it can improve service delivery. We just heard from Luciana, a wonderful story about chatbots. We can also support our decision-making abilities. So we can automate a lot of the triage. Uh, I'm thinking of, of immediate applications around fraud detection, for example. We can support ourselves with advanced analytics. So our ability to predict outcomes, intelligence gathering, and then of course, internal processes. And I'm gonna speak to just a couple of examples to try to make this as concrete as possible. If you go on to slide eight, you'll see these are not theoretical ideas. These are things that are actively in production in our governments. So I want to make it clear that when we talk about ethical approaches to AI, this is not a hypothetical future. Um, and these are just you know, a random smattering of examples that I'm personally familiar with and have been involved with, right? And so we're talking about managing our bus routes. So that's the TransLink fleet management. We're looking at predictive analytics around bus departures, um, natural language processing to help identify technical risks in our regulatory process, um, interactive court services, our ability to triage bankruptcy cases when they come into the, to the national regulatory system. Um, our ability to identify uh, regulatory infractions for toys. You know, and these, these are fascinating case studies, often using uh, content that's put uh, voluntarily by citizens online. Um, and so we're able to triage that content much more effectively using automation. I'll give you a very specific example that I was personally involved with, um, and it was from this May. Um, we, we um, at the within the government of Canada, we're responsible for for generating um, a lot of the the citizen engagement around open government. The idea, of course, behind open government being around transparency, accountability, and citizen engagement. So, if you go to slide nine, you'll see just a screen a screenshot from uh, one, of the, one of the tools that we ended up building in collaboration with OpenText, um, which is a Canadian software company using a tool um, called Magellan. And what this did was it did real-time sentiment analysis of public content that was made available through social media by participants in a major event that we did. And so this kind of analysis is absolute gold for us in the public sector, right? Previously, when you wanted to know what people were thinking, what they were saying, we would go out and we would do surveys, right? And so now with the advance of, of AI, we are able to look at public content and have real-time analytics. Um, and we're able to take a relatively nuanced approach, recognizing the limitations of these things, like not everybody is hanging out on Twitter, um, and that is in itself a bit of an echo chamber. But we are, you know, if you look at slide 10, you'll see that our ability to triage on the basis of, our, of the semantics that we're setting up is somewhat, uh, it, it's certainly improving. We can extrapolate from the, this very sort of select uh, example to broader reflections on how we can apply AI to open data. Um, when we look at data sources that are based on open data, we have incredible availability and replicability, which is really important when we talk about the ethics of AI, right? In the public sector, we have the imperative of explainability. Um, and within, within the Canadian context, we've chosen to take a fairly nuanced approach. Uh, the imperative to, to us as public officials to explain the functionality of an algorithm that we use to, for example, um, figure out which camping site you're going to be assigned when you go into our national park system. That is a lower burden of explainability and responsibility than the burden associated with using an algorithm to recommend uh, a migratory status, for example, right? And so taking that sort of triaged approach and nuanced approach is, is critical, but across the board, open data seems to be a powerful enabler for things like explainability. A second advantage of focusing on the open data space is for, for training purposes. We're looking at data here that is already relatively high quality in terms of, of data standards. Certainly within the Canadian context, we were imposing very, very high standards for uh, interoperability, for example. And so having a clean data source that is interoperable across national borders is is presumably a, a huge advantage, and that certainly is the case that we experienced. 
And finally, it's it's safe data, right? So uh, especially at the subnational level in my current role, we manage a huge amount of fairly intimate data. Um, I'm talking health records, education records. These are the sorts of things that you really do want to manage with a great deal of care. Um, open data only includes data that has already been rigorously, rigorously reviewed for privacy and security. So there are lots of advantages in terms of the open data space. If you go into slide uh, 11, um, I, I think it's, it's well worth thinking about how we behave in the public sector when we're looking to uh, apply AI to, to our processes and particularly leveraging the opportunities of open data. And I, I do want to just very briefly in the interest of time, share with you three sort of three things that I think can support a truly humanistic approach to the application of AI in the public sector. The first is what I refer to as hygiene. We need to be uh, courageous in shipping code early and often. Uh, we are paid by, by the taxpayer. It is an imperative that we, that we provide value repeatedly, quickly. Um, but we also have to impose on ourselves the, the rigor, the discipline, the culture, the governance to be able to be successful in our use of these tools. In my experience, there are three sort of categories of hygiene that are conducive to good outcomes. The first is the obsession with users, um, really making sure that we test our services out with real people. Um, secondly, being agile in everything we do, not just in shipping software, but embracing the discipline of agility um, and testing, iterating. And finally, being open. Um, so uh, yes, open data is a critical enabler, but being open in everything that we do, embracing open source code, for example, embracing transparency, building across sectors, ensuring that we have advisory committees and people scrutinizing our algorithms that are as diverse as our, our populations, that's critical. Slide 12, a second big category of, um, of, of opportunities is around building our algorithms out, embedding citizen views into the design, right? And so on slide 12, you see the results of a survey that was done in Canada um, through Ipsos uh, in 2018. And you'll see that there's a fairly clear trend here. Um, the cultural acceptance for the use of AI really does vary given the nature of that algorithm, right? So there's a high degree of acceptance when the algorithm is supporting decision-making. So you'll see the, the sort of top ones. Um, and you see the level of support decreasing fairly dramatically as we get to uh, algorithms that can have a direct impact on people's welfare and, and, and their livelihood and whatnot. So it's sort of an intimacy question. So we do have to be very, very thoughtful about the views of our citizens and design our use of algorithms on the basis of citizen preferences, in my view. And the third big category around um, sort of actions for humanistic approaches to AI in the public sector, in my view, are around trust and ethics. So on slide 13, you'll see, I put a screenshot of, a, of our ID card. Um, and this is somewhat significant uh, because British Columbia, my, my government, was the first government in North America to provide a, uh, a unified ID card based on health and driver's licensing. And this is, I think, an important kind of behavior, and it, it's a signal more than anything else, because it, <coughs> excuse me, it's a clear investment in building out trust. The backbone for collaboration in the digital age is trust. And we need to be building out mechanisms and systematic approaches to ensuring that the people we are collaborating with in the digital age are who they say they are. So looking at uh, using emerging technology, so distributed ledgers and whatnot, to provide that sort of context of trust and building out ethics on top of that would seem to be absolutely critical. So last slide, please feel free to, to follow our work. Uh, we use the hashtag DigitalBC. Um, and, and there are tremendous opportunities around the use of open data for scalability, availability, replicability, and of course, the, the, the safety and assurance that we can provide our citizens when it comes to the ethical use of AI. So I, I'll pause there and thank you very much for, for accommodating my, my remote participation. Um, I'm sort of at that strange time where it, it's 2.22 a.m. So I'm not quite sure if I'm supposed to be going with the wine or the coffee at this point. So uh, thank you for, for bearing with me on this. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much.
Jamie Boyd for your for sharing your vision on open data, open government, and the approach to artificial intelligence. So if you are in Vancouver now, it's time to go to bed. So have a nice step. Okay, so let's move quickly to Krzysztof Izdebski, and he is a lawyer, activist from Poland, and he works for, and he's uh, also the director of uh, Ipensk Foundation, uh, more or less, yeah, like that. So please, uh, it's time to, uh, you have the floor uh, to share your vision about artificial intelligence and also uh, uh, human, humanistic design. Okay, um, okay, it's on. Um, I'll be very brief because I see we're running out of time. Um, so basically what I want to concentrate it may be taking something that Jamie already uh, mentioned is the, how you design the algorithms or AI artificial intelligence solutions within the government in the context of the uh, citizen state uh, relations. We did a report in several countries in Central and Eastern Europe and what we have found out is basically that uh, there is a lack, there's like different levels of lack of transparency and uh, that uh, that is a that, that is a main problem uh, which is connected with the general issue that the citizens have a lack of trust in politicians or public officials, unfortunately, for different reasons. But there is this magical belief from the side of the government sometimes that we as citizens, we would believe uh, machines created by politicians uh, more easily, which is a quite opposite thing because when we were talking with the people, um, when we were doing the report, uh, when you have to deal with any case that concerns your life, your situation, and the government is responsible for this, uh, you are kind of having this position of being aware of getting into the contact with administration because you're not sure about the result. Still, if the machine uh, is, uh, is uh, deciding, because this is what you understand, the machine is deciding on you, you feel that you don't have a place to, um, to refer to, that you are actually talking with someone who has no uh, human instinct. And I think this is always very important in the terms okay. of having the direct contact with, uh, with the uh, public officials. So I think this is something that while, at least in the countries we, we did the report, is completely underestimating. There's no human-centered design, there's no um, will of engaging uh, citizens or any other groups that are impacted by machine, uh, by uh, automated decision making in the process of actual design. Not because they are experts in the fields, of course they not, but giving the possibility of this feeling of ownership and understanding why this solution is not designed to harm them, but to support them uh, in, their, in, their, in their lives. Um, one of the examples that we, uh, we, we have is the systems of, allocations <coughs> of allocation of judges to the specific court cases. And this is a <coughs> very interesting example because although it directly impacts citizens, but it builds also the mistrust <coughs> between judges themselves. The system was uh, only tested in, uh, in two courts before it was really introduced. The effects of the test, the information of the test, were never uh, really uh, revealed uh, to the judges or to the, <coughs> or, sorry, to the broader uh, to the broader um, the public. The judges cannot compare the data with what other judges got, so meaning I'm not really sure whether my 10 cases is less or more than uh, my uh, colleague have. And in, especially in the context of discussion on independence of judiciary or this like general mistrust to the government, these are the things that increase uh, the, the problem within the uh, the trust to uh, public administration. And although we haven't really, uh, so in, in the terms of transparency, any discussion of using the open data, not only in the terms of the open data standards are being, uh, being easy to, re, uh, being reusable, etc., 
but first of all, one of the standards that we have in open data, which is the metadata. So you describe what kind of a data you are really using. So you can, from that, if you're not the specialist, you can understand more how the system was uh, was created. Uh, so we don't we don't have this, and I'm not want to sounds like I'm blaming the government for this. I think this is something that is still too fresh for them to understand how it's important because what we, especially having this transparency approach, see is public officials, they don't understand how the AI or algorithm works as well. But for citizens, and this is something that is crucial what also we, we saw, we saw in, in, in the interviews we had with the people, that the person would not contact the company that created uh, uh, an, an algorithm. The, it will contact, the, the citizen will contact the public official because this is a natural thing. But the public officials are not prepared for that. Uh, from the very beginning, I mean, this is the whole discussion, we don't have a time for that, how to procure machine learning or automated decision uh, uh, making uh, tools in the first place. So uh, I think the whole discussion about the, the human-centered design should also involve not only the groups of citizens, but also public officials, which will actually be using or be responsible for the usage. And uh, the problems when they are occur, and the problems are occurring, of course, uh, the public officials should be prepared at least to give this like first uh, first post of explanation of what went wrong, what are the possible uh, solutions to uh, to the problem because again one of the the, uh, the cases we had it was an algorithm that allocated the children to the kindergartens and it was like completely wrong and imagine that if like you want to send your kid to the kindergarten and something is wrong and you're not really sure if it's like in the kindergarten or it's not in the kindergarten or it's like in the good age group or not, this is not a lot of things in the world that you are much worried about your own kid. So you don't care about uh, that the trade secrets, the company uh, knows how to do it or like you have to trust because this is a machine and this is a random system. Uh, you have to remember uh, about this human factor and uh, and build competencies around uh, public sector. One more minute. You finish? Yes. Oh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Christoph. No, uh, you are the the only one that uh, uh, here in one time. So. Now we have only uh, five minutes to conclude, so I move uh, the floor to Luis Aranda. Uh, Luis Aranda is an engineer and economist, and he, he works as a policy analyst for OECD. So, okay. Well, um, I'm very honored to be in this panel, um, surrounded by such talented colleagues. Uh, it's been very interesting so far. So what I'm gonna try to do today, I'm, I'm gonna try to briefly, we, we don't have much time, so I'm gonna go uh, very quickly, and I'm gonna present what we at the OECD have done uh, in the realm of artificial intelligence, and highlight in particular uh, the humanistic approach that we've taken so far. Um, so many of you have probably, I'm gonna start from the end and then I'm gonna move my way backwards. Um, you, you've probably heard about the OECD AI principles already, uh, probably several times this week. Uh, so you may, you may ask yourself, what are these principles? You know, what, what's the whole buzz all about? Uh, well, very simply, and as, as Jessica Cousins put it in her article uh, in The Hill, one week after the, the principles were launched, she said uh, that the OECD AI principles are the world's first intergovernmental policy guidelines in AI. So what does this mean? Well, we have a lot of other principles uh, going around in the world, other organizations coming up with principles, ethical guidelines, etc. But so far, the OECD AI principle ha principles have been the only ones adopted by governments. So now you, you may say, okay, it's, it's the governments from the OECD countries, so the rich country club uh, as some, some people uh, may call it. Well, that's not uh, completely true. It is true, in May this year, the OECD countries adopted them. 
along with six other countries, uh, five of them from Latin America, including Brazil and Argentina. Uh, but then in June, something uh, very uh, successful happened for, for these principles because they were, uh, the, the G20 came up in Japan with their own set of uh, AI principles, the G20 AI principles. And if you look at them and you compare, you compare them with the, with the OECD principles, word by word, they're the same. So uh, it's, 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 this is important because what you see in the map, it's probably more than 90% of AI development uh, in the world. Uh, so working my, my way backwards a, a little bit, uh, I'm not going to go through this slide. I'm just going to mention uh, the AI expert group that we formed to, uh, to write these principles. Uh, and I'm going to mention this because, as I understand, some countries are trying to come up with their own set of AI principles, including Brazil. So I, I was talking to Diogo and Wagner yesterday. And I think the key success factor for, for, for these principles was the multi-stakeholder approach that we took. We had 52 experts. Uh, it was not OECD staff drafting the principles. It was the experts from all walks of life, including academic, uh, private sector, labor unions, civil society. And this is what made us reach consensus. Uh, with the principles. Uh, now, I try to put them in one, in one slide, so if you want to take a picture, this is the right time. It's, uh, um, we have five values-based principles and five uh, recommendations for policymakers. As you can see, we, have, uh, we start with inclusive growth and sustainable development, all the way to accountability uh, for AI actors. And in the recommendations, well, we try to, tell, we try to um, make some suggestions for governments to push, to move forward in AI. I'm not going to go through them uh, in view of the time. Uh, and I'm, I'm just going to present to you a couple of clippings uh, that relate to the topics of the, of the panel today. So for instance, uh, human-centered AI. You have principle 1.1 and 1.2 about advancing inclusion of underrepresented populations, human-centered values and fairness, for instance. Now, this is the movie trailer. Is not the spoiler. So if you want to watch the whole movie, read the principles. It's five pages. It's a little bit more than 140 characters, but we'll, we'll be okay, I think. Um, if we talk about data, we also mentioned that uh, along the principles, uh, as we encourage governments to invest and encourage private investment in open data sets, for instance, and data trust. Um, so what's next for us? Uh, we want to move from words to action at the OECD. We want to move from principles to practice. Uh, and so we're going to launch the OECD.AI Observatory in February 2020. And we're basically just following up on the recommendation uh, to try to monitor the implementation of the principles by countries. Okay, and, and to convince you that we're taking a humanistic approach, uh, we've included the uh, Vitruvian Man in the logo. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. this is, we're going to show live data points, like, for instance, AI-related news as they happen um, in the world. You can see them by geographical location in all languages uh, just popping up in the map. And, and also, like, another thing that we're going to show is AI research by country, how they have uh, advanced in time. Okay, you can see uh, it's going to be, this is Gapminder style. It's five, a five dimensional uh, chart. And just to wrap it up, um, I, I was walking the other night along the Berlin Wall uh, and I saw this painting and it really caught my attention. It says, get human, you know, and uh, being Mexican, I know there's nothing human about walls, yet we, we keep building them. So let AI not become the new wall that divides our societies between the rich and the poor the developed and the developing, the haves and the have-nots. Um, the time to act is now, and it's good that we're having these discussions here. Thank you. OK, you made it, Luis. Thank you very much for your sharing. And before finishing, I want to thanks a lot for Amanda to, for the support she gave us. And also I want to thanks to Natalia. She is the rapporteur uh, for this whole meet. So you are the memory of this meeting. So thank you very much. And we run out, uh, out of time. So thank you very much for your presence here. And we are leaving the floor. Again, thank you for the sharing that you could have with all the panelists here. OK, bye-bye.